Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Death, if we wanted to be somewhat facetious, we could call one of the great mysteries of life and part of our existential condition. It's one of those ultimate things that Shestov thinks we don't really know that much more about than our great great ancestors did and at the same time it's inescapable and we have to try to grapple with it. Typically we do so through the modality not just of mourning with other people, which he doesn't talk that much about in this work, but fear, fear of our own death, fear of what death means. And he's got a passage, uh, chapter 63 in part one, where he says, fear of death is explained conclusively by the desire for self-preservation. He's not saying that he actually buys this. This is what other people are putting forth. It's, it's self-preservation. Every living thing tries to maintain itself in its being. We have a natural instinct to avoid death and what is dangerous to us. And then he says, you know, if that was really the case, then the fear should disappear in old and sick people who ought to, by nature, look with indifference upon death. Whereas the horror of death is present in all living things. So here's some important counterexamples. The closer that people do get to their death, the more, in some cases, they're actually preoccupied with it. They fear it all the more. So he says, doesn't this suggest that there's still some other reason for the dread and that even where the pangs of horror cannot save a person from their end, still it's a necessary and purposeful anguish, anxiety, worry, concern. There isn't any uh, sort of natural, scientific, reductive explanation that's going to make sense out of death. And then he says the natural scientific explanation here, as usual, stops halfway and fails to lead the human mind to the promised goal. We don't really know why we're so anxious, so afraid of death. Modern scientific explanations are not going to be particularly helpful. In another important passage, he's going to tell us that modern science wants to sort of tranquilize us when it comes to death. He tells us, here we go, this is in chapter 72. He says that, Modern science forbids men to fear and insists on a tranquil attitude, and we arrive at utilitarianism and the positivist philosophy. Utilitarianism, it doesn't do any good to be worried about death, and the positivist philosophy, uh, don't say anything that isn't purely positive, that is something that you know in the, the present or your, your you know, recent experience, something that could be scientifically attested. Everything else is really metaphysical or religious mumbo jumbo that you should put aside. Be an adult. That's the way the positivists framed things. And Shostov says, you know, that is an attitude somebody can take. I don't know that everyone can be as conclusive about that. As a matter of fact, our existential condition means that the technologists, the lab rats, the people who are you know, pushing the scientific point of view, since they do have to live as human beings, uh, thirstily longing to get out of the enclosure of positive knowledge, um, they have to deal with the fact that we are going to die. Science can't give us the last word on that. He says, Humankind has no means by which to perform on itself such a monstrous castration, right? You can't get rid of death and our normal, typical fears about it. So even the people who are pushing this scientific point of view 
if they are able to live it through, that's really a rarity. So interestingly, in this very chapter, he talks about the criticisms of Gogol, another Russian author. Uh, he says that Gogol succumbs to the fear of death, of devils, and of hell. And Shestov says, you know, that's actually an on-point criticism. Um, I find the accusation just. Gogol definitely feared death, demons, and hell. And then Shestov gives you a little bit of a twist. He says, it's not really whether he did that. We have to make an additional assumption here that he was wrong in doing that. Maybe fear of death, devils, hell, can actually be all right. Maybe that can be what we ought to do. I mean, we can have all sorts of different configurations. It doesn't necessarily have to be Dante's Inferno with all the different levels. I mean, if you look across religions, you're going to find that it's not just Christianity or even the Abrahamic monotheistic religions that have hells. It's pretty widespread. And you, I'm not just talking about, say, you know, Greco-Roman religion or anything like that. You look at religions that have reincarnation like Buddhism and Hinduism, and there are multiple hells in which a person can find themselves and multiple beings that would carry out torments and death at the center of that. So these fears that human beings have, we're not saying that they're necessarily rational. They're definitely not scientific. But it's not as if modern science can just wave its, its magic wand and say, these are to be dispelled as irrational. And so, you know, he says, the point is whether it's not right to fear these things and whether fearlessness would be a proof of the high development of a person's soul. He says, Schopenhauer asserts death-inspired philosophy, all the best poetry, the wonderful mythology of the ancients and modern people have for their source the fear of death. Only modern science forbids people to fear and insists on a tranquil attitude towards death. We could also add into that certain philosophies that denigrated the fear of death, Epicureanism, Stoicism. You know, these are, are philosophies that, that could also be lumped in there with modern science in saying, don't worry about this sort of thing. He also talks about philosophers and whether they had good deaths and whether their, their ideas about death were particularly on point. And this is kind of interesting. This is chapter five, right? He talks about um, Plato's last conversations, uh, Plato's account of the last conversations with Socrates, the days, the hours of the old man are numbered, and yet he talks, talks, talks. He talks about Credo and, and that dialogue. He talks about the Phaedo. He says... Um, it could be that Plato's not altogether to be trusted, but we have it from other sources that Socrates spent the month following his verdict in incessant conversations with his pupils and friends. That is what it is to be a beloved master and have disciples. You can't even die quietly. So is this the best way to, to live out one's last moments and cross the threshold into death. Shostov actually seems to be saying, no, that's, that's not the best thing. He actually also brings up Pascal. He says, Pascal, as his sister tells us, talked a great deal before his death. De Musset cried like a baby. Perhaps, here's an interesting suggestion, Socrates and Pascal talked so much for fear they would start crying. Because crying would at least be sort of an authentic reaction to the fact that you're going to die. And you're going to leave behind what? Your disciples, your ideas. Um, in, interestingly, at a, another point, this is in uh, chapter 25, he talks about um, death, this, this sort of, you know, truism of death being the inspiration of philosophers. He says, um, it's become a platitude that fear of death is the inspiration of philosophers. Numberless quotations could be drawn from ancient modern writers if they were necessary. Maybe the poetic daimon of Socrates, which made him wise, was only fear personified. And then he talks about Tolstoy as well. And he says, if, if we were in Socrates' time, maybe Tolstoy would be talking about a daimon or his dreams. Instead, he squares his accounts with science and morality in place of gods and demons. The last thing that he says that's really interesting about philosophers and death is that their ideas are left behind 
as if those are their legacy. This is in chapter 18 of part one. He says that ideas, whether proven or not, are the dearest possession in life to them, in sorrow a consolation, in difficulty a source of counsel. Even death is not terrible to ideas. They will follow a person beyond the grave. They are the only imperishable riches. So think about Socrates and his discussion of, uh, you know, that the ideas that he's put forth are not going to go away and people are going to pick them up and continue criticizing his fellow Athenians. Plato is writing, you might say, to, to keep ideas in the world after him and so many other philosophers. He says, all this the philosophers repeat very eloquently, repeat and reiterate concerning their ideas, no less skillfully than advocates plead their cases on behalf of thieves and swindlers, right? <laughs> that these ideas are what are going to live they are going to be their legacy. Shestov actually has a different suggestion for us, and this is a bit later. This is in uh, part two of the work in a chapter called Death and Metaphysics, chapter 37. He tells us that um, the, the roads to good things are dangerous to travel. And so he says that the more alluring an end we have in view, the more risks and horrors we must undertake to get there. Let's make a contrary suggestion. Behind every danger, something good is hidden. Danger serves as an indication, a mark to guide us onward, not as a warning as we're taught to believe. Now, what does this have to do with death? He immediately tells us to decide this would be to decide that behind death, the greatest of dangers must lie the most promising things. And then he says it's as well not to speculate further. We'd best stop lest we quarrel with metaphysics. We don't actually know what's going to happen when we die, but maybe it's actually not that bad. Maybe we don't have to console ourselves with imaginations like, well, I'm going to be in heaven or down you know, in Hades and argue with all of the old ghosts and find out you know, whether Achilles was really as brave as they say, the way Socrates says. Maybe we don't have to project all sorts of things out there for ourselves, but perhaps there is something good there for us. And now this is very interesting, and this is well worth closing these reflections on. He tells us we must make use of every Everything to serve the ends of this life of ours. And in the middle of that, he interjects, even of death. We must make use of everything, even of death, to serve the ends of this life of ours. We, you know, if, if fear of death inspires philosophizing, that's great. It doesn't have to turn into some sort of rigid approach to things that we're engaging in basically to try to put those fears at rest. Maybe it's okay to be afraid of hell and the devil and death. Or maybe it's even afraid, okay to be afraid of what if I get into heaven and I'm bored there? You know, that's, that's also a possibility, is it not, right? Or what if I get to heaven and find out I was totally wrong about religion? I was an atheist and then there's God. What do I do? You know, these, that's perfectly fine to, to speculate about these things. We can make use of death, which we're going to face eventually, to live a fuller, better, more thoughtful life. 